so I don't work on ads that much, but I think I want to pop this up to a level where, you know, recommender systems and search engines, which are the problems that I work on more, kind of share a lot with the ad placement problem. And that level is that, you know, we have systems that are actually interacting with the world. These systems, you know, like a search engine, a recommender system, ad placement system, or e-commerce system, they are con constantly making interventions, right? So they are presenting a ranking, they are placing an ad, they are recommending a movie, and then they get to observe what the user does in response, right? In a sense, they're constantly running these micro experiments and they're observing what the outcomes of these micro interventions are. So, <clears throat> and of course, you know, these systems do this on a huge scale. They do this for billions of users, billions of items, and we have log files that are kind of locked responses to interventions that are some of the biggest data sets that we have. And clearly there's information in these data sets, right? You know, and we want to use these data sets to measure how well our systems are doing, to learn how to, to learn better systems. And really this is a great source of world knowledge for these systems, right? They learn from these interventions and from the responses of the users about the items that they care about, about their domain, and about the users for personalization. Okay, let me make this a little bit more specific, what I mean, and try to formalize that a little bit. So here's an ad placement system, it needs to place an ad up here. And uh, so there's some context in which this ad gets placed. So there's a user and this particular page, and we call this context X typically here. Then the current system that's running makes a decision. It takes an action to place this particular ad there. And what we get to see in response is the feedback that the user gives us. Let's say the user clicks on this ad or does not click on this ad. But really the feedback could be anything, some any number. So I know that click-through rate is not the preferred measure that you want to optimize, right? Whatever that measure is, if it's a number, this is the feedback that we're going to have. Now what's interesting here is that, you know, the system could have taken many other actions. And we don't actually get to observe what would have happened if the system had picked a different action, right? How would the user have responded to a different ad that we could have placed there, right? So, same thing here. Uh, this is a personalized newspaper, um, and it's, you know, there's a user coming in and has certain attributes. And that's our context. Uh, the action that we are taking here, our current system puts together this nice front page of current articles. That's the action, why? And then the feedback that we have and that we want to optimize and maximize somehow, let's say, is the reading time, the time that the user spends in our system. Right? And again, the system picks one action, gets to observe the feedback for one action, but it doesn't get to observe what would have happened if it had presented a different homepage here. And finally, search engine is again the same story, right? The context X is a query. The search engine takes an action Y presenting this particular ranking. And then the feedback that we get to observe, we can derive from the clicks on that particular ranking, but we don't get to see what would have happened if we had presented a different ranking. So at that level, really what we get and what's in the, these terabytes of log files from our systems is these triplets of context X, action that the current system, which I'm going to call the policy pi null, also called logging policy, took. That's the Y. And then the kind of observed feedback that we got for the, from the user for that particular action. And we have many, many, many of those, right? So this is really banded feedback. It's not full information feedback like in supervised learning necessarily where we get a ground truth label. We just get to observe what happened when I took this action. That's, that's the way that I'm going to interpret this data. You can interpret it in different ways as well, and we'll get to that later, but this is the way I'm going to interpret it. And if you think about a probabilistic model for this, then you know, your context come nicely IID, let's say, to some extent. Um, uh, the feedback is you no know, condition on the action and the outcome, let's say, is, um, is, um, is just a distribution. And the current system that places the actions that were actually in the log file, that's our system pi null, our logging policy. And that is actually, you know, it's a system that we've built, but it's something that contaminates our data, right? 
by picking a you know, by picking actions from this policy panel, I explore certain actions for certain users much more likely than other actions for other users, right? So really, this system pinal here is a huge source of selection bias of where I'm actually going to get data. And that's something we are going to deal with in, in this talk. Um, so the goal, nevertheless, is to use this bias data that we have and to find a new system pi, to learn a new system pi that selects actions that have better kind of expected deltas. So that's our problem statement. And by the way, if you have any questions throughout, just you know, feel free to ask. So if I think about machine learning on a, you know, on a very high level scale, then we can have do online learning, where we're kind of interactively querying things, right? Have interactive experimental control or batch learning, where we simply have like a, you know, a batch of data, but we can't get more data. And we have full information learning. Uh, where somebody gives us the complete loss function or partial or banded feedback, where we just get to observe this partial uh, feedback on the loss. And three cells of this table are very well explored. And what we are going to be in, or what we're going to explore in this talk is really this cell. How can we do batch learning with banded feedback? Okay, so this is our problem statement here. Learn from this banded feedback a new policy that selects better actions. First, we'll think about you know, how could we approach this problem. We'll come up with a principle um, which we call counterfactual risk minimization um, and basically define the problem in, in a particular way and then see whether this principle can actually be turned into efficient <coughs> algorithms. And uh, I'll talk about basically a way of training conditional random fields with bandic feedback, not with full information feedback, but with bandic feedback, and how to treat, train deep networks, not with full information feedback, like expensive hand-labeled examples, but this cheap, plentiful bandit feedback that we get basically for free from our online systems. And I'll talk a little bit on a, at an application with Criteo data for display advertising. Okay, so let's kind of build up some of the definition and some of the formal framework. So what do we want to learn? We want to learn a policy pi. And this policy is basically a mapping that takes a context x and says uh, which um, action y should I take. And for reasons that will become clear in a, in a, in a bit, we'll want this to be a, stoch a stochastic mapping. Um, so really, there is a probability distribution. Given an x, there's a distribution over the y's. And these policies we typically note by pi. So you can visualize this as this is the space of all possible actions for this context x. There's a policy pi 1 that kind of takes samples distributions from this region here. Uh, this pi 2 samples from this region here. And of course, deterministic policies are just a special case where you put all the probability mass on a, on a single point here, right? So these pi's, that's what we want to learn. How are we going to evaluate a pi, a policy? Uh, just like in supervised learning, we'll evaluate it by the expected loss or the risk, right? And it's you know, what you would think it is. You take the expectation over the context. You take the expectations over the actions that this policy takes. And then you know, this is the expectation of the payoffs, the rewards or losses, the way you want to think about it. And that's kind of the measure of quality for a policy. So here's, again, visualization where you have you know, the shading tells you what the value of the delta is. And so pi 1, you know, take the expectation over this distribution of delta. It's mostly red. So this is not a good policy for this context. Here it's mostly green. Better policy, right? Um, the problem is that we typically don't actually know these deltas, right? We only get to peak at certain deltas, at certain points that we've explored, right? But exploring this whole integral is something that we typically, or computing the whole integral is something we typically can't do, right? Because we're missing the information about the deltas. We know the pi, typically. We reconstruct the pi, the policy, right? Uh, we can sample from this, but this we typically don't know. So how can we get an estimate of the risk? Well, we can do A-B testing. 
uh, you know, we, what we would just do is if you want to evaluate a policy, we take that policy, let's say pi 1, uh, we actually field it on our system. Users come in, we pick an action from this policy, we observe the delta, and keep doing that many, many times. If we average that, that's an unbiased estimate of that integral that I had expectation that I had on the previous slide, right? So if you wanted to do a learning, and we have lots of policies that we now want to pick the best one from, that's basically what learning is, right? Then we could, you know, field the first policy, evaluate it in an A-B test. Field the second policy, evaluate it in an A-B test. Do that for all policies in our policy space, and then pick the best one afterwards. Which is, of course, a horrible idea, right? This is not going to scale. And so, um, you know, each of these A-B tests takes hours or days or even weeks to run. So this is not a way that we could go. We can use A-B testing eventually to get some kind of ground truth about, you know, how well a policy is performing. But for learning, this is completely intractable. And it's also really wasteful, right? In a sense, so this is what A-B testing does. It takes, you know, it tries policy one, draws a whole bunch of data, estimates what we want to estimate, then throws away all of this data. Does it for policy two. Again, gets new data, throws away all of the old data. It's really wasteful. What we would rather want is something like what we have on the bottom here, right? So we want to generate data once, or actually we probably have lots and lots of data already um, uh, from you know, our system just running. And then we would want to address the question of this kind of counterfactual question of if we hadn't used pi null to generate that data, but we had used some other policy, what would have been the performance of that other policy if we had used it instead of pi null? So we want to do these counterfactual estimates of the performance of a policy. And we want to do it based on the same data for many, many different policies. right? And we want to reuse that data that we already have. So we want to use this locked intervention data. And that is something we can conceivably do as an efficient machine learning algorithm, right? Because we don't have to go out and get new data every time. <clears throat> OK. So how could we do this counterfactual estimation? Um, there's at least two ways. Um, a lot of the previous session was about predicting click, or so doing click through prediction, right? And that's certainly one valid way of, of, of going about this. Um, so basically in, in the kind of setup that I, you know, um, the way that I introduced it here, it would mean that we would try to learn, you know, we have some data point, we've observed the delta, the feedback here, those were not good, good ones, these are the good ones. You observed our feedback for a few actions, nicely parameterized by features here. And then we would learn a regression that would then make a prediction um, for you know, what's going to be the feedback everywhere. And if you have a good predictor like that, that's accurate, then of course we can easily solve the learning problem. Right? We can just you know, basically read off what are the actions that we should be taking. But you know, as we also saw in the previous session, this is a very hard problem, right? The click-through prediction problem. And you have, you have to deal with bias issues, and especially um, if you have, you know, high-dimensional data that, you know, the regularizer introduces bias, you have to be very confident about the functional form that you have. You may be pretty good at predicting what the value here is, but if you go out, right, um, it's not clear that, you know, you're, you're probably subject to pretty severe biases if you don't have a lot of information about your model. So I don't want to go this route. I want to go a different route instead. And especially, so it's going to be a route that is, in a sense, unbiased. And the problems will be shifted to keeping control of the variance of the problem, not of the bias. And here's the you know, basic idea, and it goes back, oh, my references are cut off, um, goes back all the way to the 50s to, uh, to uh, service sampling, like a Horvitz-Thompson sampling, and you know, it's kind of basic of the Rubin causal model as well, that you would do inverse probability weighting, or inverse propensity weighting. 
So applied to this particular policy evaluation problem, what you would get, if you want to get an estimate of the risk, this integral that we had on the previous slide, expected performance of the policy, to get an unbiased estimate, um, you would take the probability under your current policy that you want to evaluate and divide it by the propensity. So the probability under which, with which it was chosen by the logging policy that generated the log data. And if you, um, if this uh, uh, logging policy has the property that it puts probability everywhere where this new policy puts probability, this gives you an unbiased estimate. So simple illustration. Um, so let's say this is our logging policy here, and it generated these, these points here, good ones, good deltas, bad deltas, from this distribution. That's our pi null. And now we want to evaluate what's the performance, the, the risk of this policy here. What inverse probability weighting, or IPS, does is it upweights these points here that have high probability under the new policy and low probability under the, um, under the logging policy and downweights the points over here. And it does it in a way that it becomes an unbiased estimate. So in a sense, that's nice, right? So if we fulfill this property down here, then we know that we get an unbiased estimate. So we are, you could think, why not just do the following, right? Take this, it's an unbiased estimate of our training error, basically. That's what, or it's, it's, it's a training error, this IPS estimate. So instead of, like in supervised learning, minimizing training error directly, we could just minimize this. It's also an unbiased estimate. And so what we would do, we would search our policy space and find the one that minimizes this empirical risk in the kind of machine learning um, um, speak. Sounds good at first, but there are a couple of things that you have to worry about. There's a whole new way you can kind of overfit. And um, so let's say you have your logging policy, and you are now evaluating the risk of the, the you know, estimated risk of this policy pi one. You know, there are lots of large weights here. Um, and you probably get a pretty reasonable estimate that has low variance. It's unbiased and there's no variance. But probably somewhere in your hypothesis space, you also have this policy 237 that puts the probability mass all the way up into this right-hand corner. And so what inverse probability weighting does is it gives huge weight to this one point up there and almost zero weight everything, everywhere else. It's still an unbiased estimate, but it's an unbiased estimate with one, over one sample, basically. So the variance of this guy is going to be terrible. So, you know, you shouldn't trust the risk estimate in this situation, or you should, you know, appropriately discount compared to this situation, right? So basically what's happening here is that if you look at, you know, we've actually derived generalization error bounds for this, is that if you want to get reasonable generalization error bounds, you have to take into account one additional kind of source of overfitting. So the bounds look roughly like this. If you want to get a bound on the expected performance of the policy, you take the training error, that's basically what this is, you take a capacity control regularizer, that's your normal overfitting control, like VC dimension or something like that, but then you have this additional term that now accounts for the variance of this empirical risk estimate. And in supervised learning, the variance of all empirical risk estimates for all hypotheses in your hypothesis space is roughly the same. But I've just given in the previous example, here the variances can be vastly different for different policies, and you have to account for that. <clears throat> so as usual, these types of generalization error bounds by itself are pretty loose but they t give you a good indication of what you should be optimizing, right? What are the important ingredients uh, that should you be optimizing? And, you know, it's just like, I don't know, these generation error bounds gave rise to SVMs or to deep networks with weight decay and things like that, right? So we can take this bound as a constructive principle of what 
a machine learning algorithm for this particular setting should be doing. And it should be optimizing something like this, right? It should be optimizing training error, a capacity control, and a variance control as these two sources of overfitting. So we call it this counterfactual risk minimization in the kind of analogy to structural risk minimization for the supervised learning case. So, okay. Um, can we turn this now actually into efficient algorithms that are scalable and where you can have, you know, that you can actually apply to industrial sized data. So let's start with a CRF that we'll train based on bandit feedback. So the first thing that we have to kind of decide on is what's our policy space, what's our hypothesis space. And as I said, we want to train a CRF-like model, and that's basically what this is, right? So our policies, our stochastic policies, are going to be this you know, exponential of a weight vector that we're going to learn, times a joint feature map between an X and a Y, which you would typically derive from a Markov random field or um, something like that. And then this is just a normalizer so that the whole thing sums up to one. Um, so this is exactly the same type of hypothesis space or same type of representation that you would have in a structure SVM or in a CRF. It's slightly different. This is a stochastic policy. It's not a kind of conditional likelihood that you're estimating, but the, the functional form is the same. OK, so how do we take this hypothesis space and now do training with it? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. We had our counterfactual risk minimization objective. And so we just take that definition of what a policy looks like, and we basically plug it into that objective that we want to optimize. And you know, it, it's really just a plug-in. And this is a kind of way of shortening the presentation. So it's, you have here your unbiased risk estimator. That's your training error. Here you have a capacity control term, uh, like an L2 regularizer that you typically have in an SVM or a CRF. And this is your variance control term. And it turns out you can use estimated variances. You don't actually have to know the variance. Um, what I'm going to sweep under the rug for this purpose of this talk is how do you actually now minimize, how do you find the weights, W, that minimize this expression? Looks a little bit daunting, but there's a simple majorization trick that you can do that decomposes the thing so that you can do a stochastic gradient on it. And if you look at the paper cut off down here, uh, you'll, it's actually a really simple trick. So you can optimize this very efficiently at industrial scale with your favorite stochastic gradient method that you may have. So here's a little synthetic experiment. Um, so uh, to be able to kind of make the problem easier and harder and explore different directions and have, still have some ground truth, we took a multi-label data set, text classification data set, and uh, turned, kind of generated bandit feedback synthetically from it. So what it basically means is, given a text document X, we are now predicting a vector of labels. You know, is it about politics? Is it about sports? So a, kind of a bit vector by some long -age policy pi null, which we picked to be a pretty mediocre policy. Um, and now the feedback that the system gets, that's the bandit feedback, is it's not like in supervised learning, here's the correct label vector. But for this particular prediction of labels, you made three errors, right? So now we can vary the number of labels and, and everything and make the problem easier and harder. So here's a learning curve. So this red line up here is the performance of the logging policy and lower is better. So our logging policy in terms of this Hamming loss, how many of the labels did you get right, is, um, is pretty bad. This curve down here, or this line down here in blue, that's cheating. Uh, that's if you train a CRF that uses the same features on the full information data. So that's kind of as good as you could possibly hope to get on this data set. And this is the performance of our Bennett training algorithm called POEM on, I should have said this, uh, called POEM 
on the, um, on the banded data. And if you give it more and more banded feedback data, sa uh, sampled from this, uh, from this logging policy, you'll, you know, you're approaching the performance, the Skyline performance that you could possibly get. So here are a couple of more data sets. Uh, again, multi-label classification data sets, different numbers of examples, different numbers of features, different numbers of labels. Um, can't cut off. Um, and here is the performance of the logging policy, which we always pick to be kind of mediocre. This is if you do kind of this, if you optimize this objective during training. So the one that doesn't account for this variance regularization, just a simple IPS estimate that you're plugging in here. And this here is the line, the results for POEM, where you do do the variance regularization. And as you can see, the, the variance regulation actually does make a substantial difference across, very consistently across all data sets. So it's important. It's not just that the theory kind of you know, predicts this, but it's actually important to do in practice. So is that, you know, is, is, is that it, basically? Um, so it looks nice. Um, but I, I tell you, uh, question? A uh, little bit of question. So um, how do you determine the hyperparameter lambda 1? Uh, so both have, there are two hyperparameters. Um, uh, the, 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 these two regularization constants, and they were selected on a validation set um, so based on. Set no. You can use, so good, excellent, excellent question. Uh, you can use banded data and do an IPS estimate on the, so it's a validation banded data set. And with the IPS estimate, you get an unbiased estimate of your valid, you know, on the validation set performance, and you do cross validation based on that. So you still have the logging for rigids. Sorry? You will have the for rigids to generate those. Yes. Validation. Oh, yeah. It's very important. You have to keep track of these propensities, right? When you generate your data, you write this additional number. What was the probability of this action? You just write it into your log file. Yeah. Um, so there's actually a lot, of, a lot of things that are very obviously improvable about this. Um, and one is the, the choice of estimator here and this inverse propensity scoring estimator. Um, that's definitely not the, the best estimator to use. Um, I mean, there are theoretical reasons for this, but there's also a very intuitive reason. Um, let, me, let me give you the intuitive reason. Um, so here's a little example. Uh, so these are my X's, my samples that I have. These are the different actions that could have been taken. And the ones and zeros tell, you know, and the, and the shading tell you um, the losses, right? Um, one means you got it wrong, zero means you got it right. And these, the ones with the blue box around it, that's the one you actually know. The other ones you don't know. So can anybody think a way, so what's a policy pi that minimizes this formula here? You can actually get it easily down to zero. And you can get it down to zero in a, a nice way um, that you, for example, put all the probability mass on the green guys here. Right, And so you'll hit all of the zeros here. But you can also get it down to zero by doing that, putting all the probability mass on these guys. So if you put probability mass one here, it doesn't hit any of the observations that you have in your training set. So basically, you will have a zero everywhere where you have a delta here. So by avoiding your data, basically, you can make this Thing become zero. You know, this is an extreme case, and if you, you know, if you have random observations here, this is, un, you know, th this extreme case is li unlikely to happen. But still, you get the idea that you can kind of cheat minimizing this by actually avoiding the training data. So how can we detect that our kind of estimator is cheating? And the way that you can do this is by, if you take this delta off in the end here, 
and look at just this quantity here. For any policy pi and for any logging policy pi now, this always has expectation one. Now, if you cheat and you miss the data, you will see that this is far from expectation one. And you can use this knowledge of the expectation of this quantity as a control variant. And one way, there are many ways how we could possibly do it, um, is to use it as a multiplicative control variant. So we know that the expectation of this guy is one. So um, uh, well, it's just the one liner here. Um, so what we can basically do is we can use it as a control variant by dividing by this quantity. And so basically, if you if you cheat and you avoid the data, this will be less than one, and it gives you a penalty. Right? So this is called the self-normalized IPS estimator, or SNPs. And um, it has a, it's biased, but asymptotically, the bias decays. But it can have much lower variance as well. And it has another property that's called equivariance that, you know, that, that's very nice, but I'll, I can't go into detail here. So but what you can basically do is can plug in this other estimator everywhere else here and, you know, do the same thing. And so that is basically the, the poem with a self-normalized estimator is uh, what we call a norm poem. And again, you have to think about how do you optimize this. And um, there's a way to turn this you lose Lagrange multipliers to, to decompose this problem again. And you can do stochastic gradient on it again, and you can do it large scale and everything. A again, if you're interested in this, talk to me afterwards. So by just switching the, the risk estimator, we, you get another pretty good boost in performance. And I'm, I'm pretty sure this wasn't the, you know, still there's lots of open space for improvement. So this is, uh, now we've taken um, these algorithms and now um, we've applied them to a app placement data set that we collected together with Criteo, especially with Damien Lecotier. And so the problem is here, the task is that for a given user, we want to pick a product from a candidate set to place into this ad. And there's roughly 10 products or so. I know this is not a Criteo ad, but it's the only one I could find where there was a single slot to fill. Um, Somehow, <laughs> Criteo, when I tried it, it always gave me like six, so I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> um, so which, you know, should we put a washing machine here? Should we put a dishwasher here? Yeah, and so on. So performance measure here is click-through rate. We have um, uh, 21 million examples from a stochastic production system with locked propensities. And a feature vector after binarizing had about 70K features, binary features. Again, experiment setup, train, validation set. We pick parameters on this banded validation set, evaluate on the test set. Uh, and yeah, if you're interested in this data set, there's a link on the last page. Uh, here's the results. Um, if you just pick one at random, you get this click-through rate times yeah, 10 to the minus four. Um, this is the, uh, the performance of the logging policy, I think after some obfuscation, well, I don't know. Um, if you train a click predictor um, using the same 70,000 features in a linear model here, you and derive a policy from that, you actually become worse than your logging policy. I'm not saying that you couldn't define, get a better click predictor, but it's pretty easy to have biases here that kind of you can't detect and that would you know, destroy your performance. If you just do this straightforward uh, IPS, you get about the same performance here as the logging policy. If you do doubly robust, um, as you know, the, uh, John Lang in, uh, as implemented in uh, John Langford's Warpo Wabit, um, you get it's kind of a combination of these two. You get it's, and it's also a variance control standard. You get up to 57. If you do this norm poem, you get to 58. So, I think there's. And this doubly robust trick, you could also, in addition, apply here and to get further variance reduction. So we haven't done this yet, but there's, I think there's lots of room for improvement. Okay, so was there anything specific about training CRMs and POEM 
And let me just very briefly tell you that you know, basically you can do the same thing for a deep network as well, if that's what you want as your policy class. What you do is you define your part in this space, and you basically have a soft max output layer here. And instead of having this linear model in there, you put a deep net in there. As long as it's differentiable, you're OK. Uh, so these Ws are now parameter tensors that you want to train. So it's basically a deep net with a soft max output. Um, next slide is going to have a very, not very deep, deep net on it. But we're also doing this like with a rest net um, for image recognition. And it, they get very good results there as well. So here is basically what you do. You plug this new architecture or this new policy class in your counterfactual risk minimization objective. You have these three components that you're optimizing. Uh, you have to worry about how do you actually train this. But again, you can decompose this in a way that you can do a stochastic gradient on it, and you can train this efficiently. And here are uh, very, very, very recent results for um, the Criteo data. Um, so basically, the only thing that we've tried so far is a two-layer ReLU neural net with 100 hidden units. And the only parameters that we've picked on the validation set, the other ones we just picked out of thin air, is the number of epochs and this Grange multiplier that comes in the reformulation. And you basically, out of the box, get something that is, is beats the, the, the linear model. So there's a lot of, I think there's still a lot of room for improvement. Um, and that's something that we're currently working on and actually writing up. OK, so let me wrap up. Uh, so you know, I think there's an interesting way to look at this as this batch learning from Bennett feedback problem, where the goal is to find a new system that selects better actions in terms of the expected deltas. Try to motivate this particular approach of doing this counterfactual risk minimization to, for direct policy optimization. Um, and there, out, out of this came basically three methods. The POEM, this, you know, as a CRF trained with bandit feedback, normalized POEM with the self normalized estimator in there, and the bandit net um, learning method, where you basically train a dual net or a deep net uh, with this bandit feedback instead of the kind of expensive, hand-labeled, full information data. But I think there's lots of interesting open questions, like can you do this for other algorithms? Um, maybe ones that are not differentiable, like trees. Um, other risk estimators. Um, other ways of putting control variates into this objective. Um, and if you go, there's actually a poster by uh, Aman Agarwal tonight um, on not talking about learning, but talking about the evaluation problem of how do you best estimate performance in this counterfactual way when you have data for multiple logging policies, not just one. IPS can break horribly down if, if, uh, in this situation, and you, know, you can do very simple things that, that help quite a lot. And um, I think from a kind of fundamental machine learning perspective, there is bias variance trade-offs and you know, overfitting problems that you just don't have in supervised learning. So I find it super interesting to, to think about these problems, how to control these new types of overfitting. So if you're interested, uh, there's software papers. There's a tutorial we gave last year at SIGIR, Audit and I, and the Criteo data, um, all available if you go to my homepage. All right, thank you.